everyone. Welcome to the second industry day. Um, got lots of nice guests today. Two in the morning and three in the afternoon. First up, we have Katie Maywa. Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm great. This is uh, it's great to be doing this. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks for coming. Um, so I think we'll just start off with if everybody's in. Uh, a little bit <gasps> background first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I understand you first picked up a guitar at about 17, is that right? And That's what correct. was that yeah. um, inspired by? Because I know your your mum played piano. Was that an... She did. Anything? Actually, you know what it was inspired by? It was inspired by... Um, so when I was 17, I, I was a year at the Brit School. So I was just about to start my second year at the Brit School. And I joined that school as one of the singers in the music course. Um, and in our class, there were about, I think something like four or five guitarists, a couple of drummers. Most of the girls were singers. Um, mm. And then there was a few great keyboardists and we would get put with different um, members in the class. And as a singer, I'd always get put with, you know, one of the drummers, a um, couple of the guitarists, the keyboardists. And I used to find it really difficult to direct the rest of the team. Um, and it's like, I mean, I guess you could say, but hold on, you're the singer. So why were you trying to direct? But it, that was partly because, I don't know, I kind of felt like, in a sense, as the voice, I have the quietest instrument. You know, the drums are super loud. The keyboards can be turned up. Um, I've never been a loud singer. And so I just remember thinking, getting very frustrated in that first year that like everyone's playing so loud and I was having to like scream and scream and scream. It's like, but this mm -hmm. doesn't sound good. So yeah. um, I remember, you know, part of the reason of picking up the guitar was to be like, okay, at least I have full control of the volume and the instrument. And the thing about the guitar, which was different to the piano, was that I just felt with the guitar, I was able to start writing songs really early into picking it up. You know, like once you get those three chords, then it's like, oh my God, most of the Beatles catalog is open. I yeah. mean, that's a bit of a, a joke, but you know, it's pretty much, you know, everything is kind of open to you. And I remember kind of writing my first song um, called Far Away Voice, which was actually inspired by Eva Cassidy. Uh, and that literally used, I think, the, only the three strings, the three middle strings on the guitar. Um, so, yeah, that was the beginning of picking the guitar up. And before that, did you use Cubase to write? Yeah, I did, actually. You started um, out. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, and, and also, I mean, maybe I can go back even further. So I was born in Georgia, in Eastern Europe. My family emigrated in 1994 when I was about nine years old. Um, and in Georgia, I used to sing a lot and I used to have singing lessons. It's just a culture where actually you end up having a lot of tutors even outside of school. It's just very mm -hmm. normal for like across the board. Um, and so, yeah, when we moved over to the UK, I'd still carry on having singing lessons. We lived in Belfast to begin with, and I used to go to the music school on Saturdays. Um, and to be honest, like, I used to do a lot of singing competitions from the age of about nine to 13. And then, you know, so basically in, in, in that period, I was really getting to practice a lot of stage performance um, by getting up on stage and singing songs like Summertime. Um, and that would get kind of judged um, by other singers singing Summertime. So it was kind of a classical approach to performing. Mm. And, um, and I got actually quite tired of it by the age of 13, because I thought this is, you know, too much, basically. Mm. And so I kind of stepped back from all the sort of official singing lessons and the competitions. And I focused on my GCSEs. Um, and then across the, those next two years, I really began to miss music. And then at the age of 15, I asked my dad for a computer with Cubase on it so that I could write songs. And yeah, and so that was how I started. And then that led to me going to the Brit School. Um, 
and then in the Brit School, this sort of discovery that, you know, if you're going to play with other musicians, you know, how does the communication work? Who is in charge? You know, all those things I found a big challenge. And so I dealt with it by, I guess, going on my own for a while. So um, now along the line, do you still use any sort of computer programs to like take down ideas or? I do actually, yeah. I mean, I uh, obviously everyone that I've worked with has been using Pro Tools in mm -hmm. the industry. Um, and there was this great thing that I saw Joni Mitchell talk about in an interview. And she spoke about the sort of the hierarchy of the ones in the studio that know how to use the technology. Mm -hmm. And she kind of mentioned it as if it was some silent warfare that she'd been witness to, you know, as if she'd been kind of taken out of a place of authority because she didn't know how to use the technology. And I remember thinking, you know, gosh, I mean, I guess for a, um, a female singer songwriter in the music industry in the sort of late sixties, early seventies, you know, yeah, you could, you could end up in quite interesting situations. Um, so I would always, every time I'm in the studio, uh, on any project, on any record, I'd always like have my eyes glued to the screen and be like, okay, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you do kind of, you know, from my knowledge of using Cubase at 15, um, to then just observing very carefully when I wasn't singing or tracking vocals, you know, I can use Pro Tools, but I use it mainly for my songwriting. And mm -hmm. I mainly do, I guess, what you would call top line writing. Although I find that terminology a little bit I don't know. I don't think it's a very poetic term to describe what it is that I think the person that writes the words and the melody does. Um, but yeah, I use Pro Tools actually like a filing system. So, uh, you know, because I mean, for example, my, my working day um, looks like me, you know, generating a lot of lyrics and a lot of melodies. And so I need some kind of a, a system, you know, and I think Pro Tools does have a good um, titling system. You know, you can basically title every track and every take, mm -hmm. and then I can go back and see what I've got in there. It's a lot easier to collect things rather than, you know, recording into your phone just to save an idea. Yeah, or using pen and paper, you know, your notebooks yeah. can end up just piling up. Um, and so it's just a good way to sort of go back into certain songs, um, and yeah. Great. Uh, so there's a question or about five here from Faith Benson. Uh, they were sent across uh, previously to this, but if you do have any questions that you want to put into the Q&A section, then we can uh, answer them during this call. Uh, the first one is how often do you write by yourself? And how often in collaboration? Ah, that's a really killer question. Um, so my ideal is that I write mostly by myself. And the reason is that I have taken a sort of a specialized approach. And because this is, because it's my passion, a specialized approach to lyrics. And I find that lyric writing is very it's very personal, you know, because essentially you are, well, you, you know, you're trying to find your perspective of the world. You're trying to put your thoughts and ideas into songs. You know, you, you are trying to be the communicator. I mean, as a singer, I've been really fortunate in the type of career that I've had where I've not had to ever get another job. Um, but I really think my main instrument are the words. And so for the lyrics, I find I have to spend a long time what there is available in terms of education, in terms of higher education on learning how to be a better lyricist or how to compose with words for the purpose of creating great records. Um, and so that's involved a lot of technical skill development, like learning to rhyme, learning to put ri the rhythms of lines to music. Um, and so it's a combination of a lot of practice you know, and I try to think of it more as practice rather than writing. Um, and so, yeah, I would say, I don't know, like 95% on my own and then 5% co-writing. 
And actually also the reason why the co-writing is so less is because, well, I mean, let's face it, to, to ask for that amount of time from someone else, it has to be a real commitment. You know, so I tend to work with, let's say, between five to six different songwriters. Um, I won't really work with more than two on a single song. Um, I know that that can be the norm in the industry where, you know, there can be like some like eight writers on a song, but I tend to work with like one or two. Um, and then we'll only really do one or two days, sometimes maybe three days. Um, and then maybe we'll scatter that across a few weeks or months. Um, so yeah, a couple of days at a time. And then most of my work is then going away and refining the words. And then that will be, you know, could take months. Sometimes it's taken years. <laughs> uh, that's uh, something you said ties in with another question from Faith, which is, uh, do you or did you ever do song writing exercises? So like, um, I'm not really sure of, I'm not really aware of any, but like, well, you know, okay, so, sort of plans to, and like, yeah, I, to be honest, that's, uh, again, I would say that's most of what my work looks like. It's song exercises and you know, what's lovely about it. It's because, well, one of the things that's lovely about it is first of all, songwriting is one of these strange forms of writing where there is this weird potential that you could suddenly become very rich and famous if you write a hit song. Like there is this sort of ghost in our profession that says, oh, this could become a hit and make you a millionaire. And I find depending on, you know, people's psychology, which is very important in the process of writing, that that can, um, you know, that can be really destructive for the process of writing because, you know, it, in some kind of subconscious way, it can um, override a true reason for writing a great work and a true reason to becoming skillfully the best that you possibly can. Um, so I tend to kind of get over if there's that little kind of demonic voice at the back of my head that's sort of concerned about status and writing a song or you know getting sort of moving up in the industry i get rid of that by going okay these are just exercises and this is just practice you know and i'm not trying to write a hit um because you know what i find i find in order to really truly create you have to be like so truthful to yourself you have to really convince your it's like your inner purest self to be able to come up with the goods and you can't do that if your conscious isn't really fully clear mm. um, so so yeah so what is the exercises what do the exercises look like um take things like i will be reading a poetry book for example and i might pick out words that i just love the sound of i'll write them down on the right hand side of my page and then i'll be like okay now i'm gonna write of uh, like eight verses um, and they're all going to end in these five words, yeah. you know, and I have to make sure that they would all fit into one melody. So basically, you know, you might end up having like, you know, a rambling of eight mm -hmm. verses. Uh, there's a question in the uh, Q&A chat here that says, how did the quarantine affect your songwriting and did it aid you in your craft or did it? create a wall on your creativity? Um, I have just really tried my best to ignore <laughs> the pandemic. <laughs> just because, you know, just because I think having a positive mind is so important, you know, and not to kind of go down the sort of emotional drainage of, I guess, you know, the potential trauma, you know, that it could cause if you sort of follow those stories. Um, so I've just, you know, and I've been lucky in that I was in the middle of releasing my eighth record when the pandemic happened, we were mm -hmm. actually in the middle of mixing the eighth record. And that was fascinating because I've always mixed with them, with the mixing engineer in the room. And of course we did the first two weeks of that. And that was like early March. 
And then as soon as the middle of March rolled around and everyone had to isolate, um, Cameron Craig, who was a mixing engineer, he did a phenomenal job. He, uh, he was like, I can go home and we can use a software and you can hear it as if you're in the room with me, you know, across the internet. Um, and it was fantastic. And it was great because obviously then my eye wasn't watching the screen and I was just listening and I would go from my studio headphones to the speakers, to the little iPhone headphones and just test the sound. Um, now back to how it affected my songwriting, I haven't really been doing much writing because you know, the phase that I've gone through as the pandemic's been going on has been mixing of the record, then putting all the visual side of the record together. So like I got into photography because my record company were like, we'll send you a film camera as in one that, where the photos develop. And, um, you know, and then it was about finding um, video makers, music video makers. So it was all about promo and marketing and doing interviews. Uh, and I've just started my sort of writing schedule again and how is the pandemic affecting it i think it's more about observing life and what's happened to our culture and society and being i don't know being sort of respectful to the fact that obviously there's, there's been a huge change in terms of you know our life in the west yeah. and so in terms of you know like I'm a real believer in rigorous work, you know, like viciously rigorous. I think if you want to, you know, if you really want to achieve something, um, you know, I mean, this, here's an example. There was a Canadian producer that I was working with called Bob Ezrin on this last record. He's brilliant. He's worked with Pink Floyd, Deep Purple, Alice Cooper. He's, he's a really legendary producer. And, uh, when I first played him the initial draft of my songs, which was about three months away from the recording stage, he said to me, how long have you got to put these, you know, get these songs into shape? And I said, I've got about three months. And he said to me, um, look, you need to work from now until the point you enter the studio every day. And uh, if you have a single hour spare in the day, you're kidding yourself. You're not working hard enough. <laughs> and I found that really hard to hear because, you know, of course, these days we're all very aware of the fact that we need to give ourselves rest. Um, so in a sense, I kind of, I don't necessarily agree with him because I think what's more important is to indeed have discipline and work hard and to just keep going, keep focusing on your goals, but um, to always observe your state, you know, and to like, to not get wound up by whatever it is that's stopping you from working, whether it's a distraction or, or your own laziness, you know, and like, I'll put my hand up and say, man, I can be lazy, <laughs> but you know, it's just important to kind of, it's as if you are calling some kind of, you know, part of yourself that will bring your best work forward, but you have to really respect it to get it to work. And, and you have to, I think, also respect it by giving it a lot of skills and tools by working hard. Um, and then, you know what else I find really interesting? The, the balance between our perception of working hard and then also being more passive and digesting what we see around us. So, like, in my opinion, I would say the best musicians I've worked with are the ones who like so like gluttonously listen to so much music mm. you know and it seems to develop their ears and it seems to develop their aesthetic and their ideas of what's really good what's not quite so good what's already been done and so therefore there's no need to do it again um where are the sort of gaps what it is that the listener is seeking so um so yeah, I think kind of working hard is also about passively working. Great. Uh, so we have a question from Corbin. I think we're going to bring him up to ask his question. Oh, so, yeah. Hi there. Can you hear me all right? There we go. Yes. Brilliant. 
Um, this is a, a slightly self-indulgent question. I apologize in advance, but um, I personally find it very difficult to write lyrics that sound genuine and, uh, and are actually meaningful. And I always sort of resort back to, to metaphor uh, or re resort to metaphor, I, I should say. Um, as someone who writes very lyrically driven music, what sort of advice do you have to sort of get yourself out of ruts that you keep finding yourself going into? Um, Corbin, thank you so much for your question. So it's interesting. I had exactly the same issue a few years ago. Um, and you know what? One of the things I found was that in my case, there was a huge uh, distance between my skill set when it came to me as a musical composer and my skill set when it came to me as a lyrical composer. It was kind of like this. Mm -hmm. And that's because from the age of six, I had been practicing music. I'd been performing music. I had, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's something about the nature of music that kind of we are surrounded by it and we are, you know, we hear it a lot. And so, you know, inventing music seems to be easier. Whereas when it comes to inventing with lyrics, perhaps because people use it in everyday language and there's so many different types um, of ways of speaking, there's so many different accents, there's so many different, yeah, you know, cultures in how people use language. And then there isn't really an educational system that is as sophisticated as musical composition. I think that's why, um, you know, I, I definitely found myself in that having the same issue. And so the best thing I can say to you is, you know, if you, if it's something that is a real weak spot in your skill set, you know, you need to kind of prioritize it um, and go after it. Um, you know, and that means finding the best, you know, textbooks you can on the topic and then practice. Um, so, I mean, I've got some books I would recommend. Um, for example, Fiona Sampson is a really great British poet. She's got a couple of great books about writing and composing with words. I mean, she's obviously approaching it from, from the poetry field. And then there's a huge discussion about the line between poetry and songwriting, you know, and of course we can debate that, you know, till, you know, the sun sets, but um, uh, it, you will still pick up some really interesting technicalities, um, you know, and I'm sorry to say, but it is those dull things like, you know, how to use adjectives, nouns, you know, how to explore the rhythms, how different poets have used rhythms in language. Um, I'd also recommend things, although these, I mean, these might be super basic, you might already be beyond these points. There's a great couple of courses by Pat Patterson at the Berkeley um, College, the online school, and he just teaches you just the technicality of how to put the rhythm of words to the rhythm of music um, and also how to find rhymes. You know, and again, I went down that way because it was a, a weak spot in my skill set. And I was like, every time I get to the end of the line, I don't know. What's really exciting, actually, later on today, you're going to be talking to Polly Scattergood, who I met at the Brit School. We're very good friends. But from the age of 16, she had like 800 songs written because her lyric writing just comes natural to her. It's it's phenomenal. Um, so, you know, she... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. It's amazing. But, you know, that never happened to me. Like, I had to sort of basically go back and learn A, B, C when it comes to lyric writing. There's another book by Fiona Sampson called Writing for the Self. I think it's co-written with Celia Hunt. And that's less focused on poetry writing, but it's about um, having great writing exercises so you can explore your, you know, you can mine yourself and you can mine your life and your perspective. Um, and I'd say they're really good. And then, of course, anything, anything that focuses on storytelling, because I think storytelling is really important. Um, and, and you know what else I find really fascinating? Can I ask what style of music do you work in? I mean, I hate it when I get off. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I mean is like, is, is, it, is, it, um, is it in the, well, I assume it's not in the hip hop and R&B. Not really, no, music, it's, right? it's more singer songwriter, sort of folky kind of stuff okay. really, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, so I'm in the same yeah. camp, <laughs> right? Singer songwriter. 
So we have seen when we look over to the hip hop and R and B space that they have no problem with lyrics. Mm. And that's because that is their speciality. You know, they, those, you know, they have chosen to go down that um, sp special field the way maybe some students here have decided to go down the production field. And so they're really refining their, their ears to the sonics of how to like, what plugins to use and blah, blah. So it's like, you need to become that refined at using words. There is that that much technical mm. skill set that's needed. Um, so I'm sorry, my answer isn't quick and easy, but it's just you know it just needs looking at. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for answering. I appreciate it. Thank you for the Thank question. You. Great. Uh, so next, moving on a little bit, it'd be lovely if we could maybe talk about just the journey of your career and how it's developed and maybe the differences that you can see between like the start and the end well not the end of course the the present is it? sure sure of course um okay so i began uh you know we mentioned the brit school and i was well first of all very fortunate to do an audition for Mike Bat, who was my first producer, and he's the one that wrote songs like Now Meaning Bicycles and Close Thing to Crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, Mike, um, when I met him, he was in his 50s um, and I was 18, and he was looking for a singer in the style of Eva Cassidy. So it was it was quite a strange dynamic because you know, here is this very experienced um uh, esteemed, you know, long time uh, producer in the music industry, um, based in Surrey, you know, a wealthy man. And uh, he had this beautiful house in the countryside with a great music studio, you know, and my first, well, after I auditioned, he really liked my voice. And and he was really great actually in terms of how how he built what it is we were going to do he was like look there's no pressure but let's just get together in the studio on the weekends when you're on at school so i'm still doing my last year of the brit school and um and i thought that was great and and the key also was that i really liked the type of songs that he had which were very different to everything that any of my friends were doing and anything that also, generally speaking, the pop industry was doing at the time. The only person that was kind of vaguely in a similar field was Nora Jones. So it was these very sort of classic orientated songs that kind of their, you know, their godparents were the great American songbook. And I really loved that. I really loved melodic songs that were kind of also a little sort of nod to the theatre space, even though I was never a big fan of musicals. I kind of really didn't like musicals. Um, but I like the songs. And the other thing that was incredible was he put together an amazing band, like some of the best music sessions in the country, which included Henry Spinetti, who'd played for David Bowie and Bob Dylan, great drummer, um, Tim Harris, like a genius bass player, Com like worked with Brian Eno, you know, just so avant-garde and so exquisite. And his feel is just, you know, to this day, I'm the luckiest person to know this man. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Spedding on guitar, Jim Cregan on guitar, who worked with Rod Stewart. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically Mike got his friends who were like the creme de la creme of British white blues and sort of session players. Um, and I'm like this 18 year old kid and you know, what I was hearing through the headphones as we would record, it was just complete and utter magic. And I was so in awe of what the musicians were doing. Um, and so that was brilliant. But you know what, that was in high contrast to then when I would tell my friends at school, um, you know, what those sessions were like, they were like, why are you working with this like old dude? You know, it, you should be singing your own songs. You know, you should be, you should be doing what's cool. Like not, not this like old stuff. And I remember like really struggling with that because they were all telling me like, you know, what are you doing this mm. for? You know, it's kind of, can't you see that he's using you? Like it was all that chat. And, um, and I, you know, I just didn't agree at all. Like I, there was magic happening in the studio and you could, you know, you could kind of just hear it. And, uh, and I just found it fascinating to be working with these people. So, but, as the years went on, um, we got very lucky in terms of how well those records did. 
you know, and then as I sort of turned 21, 22, as I approached my 25th year, like I did start to get restless. Um, and creatively, I did want to sort of start to kind of really direct the artistic vision. Um, and then, you know, naturally, as, as happens, Mike also struggled with that in terms of me, you know, finding my voice. And I guess like he knew me as this 18 year old kid that he met who kind of who he put so much investment in and he, you know, he really, I'm, I will always be grateful for what he did. Um, but yeah, as I approach my 30th year, we made six records together and it was, it was time for us to move in our separate ways. And so I had been so craving kind of autonomy, you know, and creating my own sort of vision for my career. And then I got it. Mm. And boy, was it a shock because I suddenly realized the amount of decisions you have to make are like outrageous. I got lucky in finding a great manager, Sumit Bothra, um, and a great management team. He works at ATC Management, who are really fantastic. And, um, you know, and it's been a slow process, a much more long term approach. You know, the way Summit works is like, OK, the artist has to set the vision and then you tell us what what you need us to do. You know, and that was music to my ears to begin with. Sorry for the cliche line, but um, I thought this is fantastic. But then actually the practicalities of that are pretty full on and hardcore. But what we are trying to do is to create the best possible records we can that I'm capable of and to you know really create a, a great legacy where you know, the art of record making can be really valued and we can put good, nutritious music in the world. Um, you know, because I think songs are capable of so much. I think records are capable of so much. And, and I'm just delighted to be able to experiment in that field. Great. Um, so would you have um, advice for younger people heading into this sort of career? Um, and is there like a, um, like a substantial sort of challenge that you faced, like the hardest one that you think that you faced and how did you overcome it in the early years? Um, well, I think my hardest challenge I faced is probably my mum. So <laughs> what I mean by that is, and when I say it's my hardest, she's my hardest challenge, I also mean that she's probably one of the greatest things that's happened to me because she is someone that gives me incredibly honest opinions. And so that ties into the type of advice I would, you know, give to say a younger me or um, anyone else coming into the industry, which is to seek the truth really courageously. You know, so whatever you're working on, have you got the guts to like play it to your mom or your uncle or your grandparent or your friend and and really open the door for them to tell you what they think of it because i find that that is really like that's how i've been able to progress from writing songs that are kind of you know embarrassing to you know, writing songs that I can really, you know, feel proud about presenting to the world. So, um, yeah, I would say seeking truth courageously is really important. And um, I know a few of our, of my course mates are doing their dissertations on the effects the music industry has on your mental health. Would you prepare, mm -hmm. uh, be prepared to talk about that? Absolutely. It's a topic I've spoken about a lot and I'm happy to because um, so when I was 26, I actually suffered from an acute psychotic breakdown and there, you know, there was a lot of reasons for it. Um, it was definitely from, you know, crazy levels of work um, because, you know, it's an international career. If you're lucky enough to succeed, which I was, there is the strange kind of psychology of your dreams having come true. And so feeling like you can't sort of complain about anything and feeling like you want to support your team and work as hard as you can. And so it becomes quite difficult to say no to things. Um, and so, yeah, that means to like a crazy schedule. It means, you know, it meant for me flying to America for like a couple of days 
having meetings, coming back to Europe, doing concerts, um, uh, then going to Japan, doing promo, you know, and then also having to try and come up with new music. So it was like a huge amount of pressure. I also had some things going on at home, which meant I didn't have that kind of safe haven that you might get. Or also, I just wasn't spending that much time at home. So, you know, my parents couldn't see, you know, how I was working, what I was doing, because you're on the road for most of the year. Um, and so there's, yeah, there's lots of aspects that can affect your mental health. And, um, you know, maybe if there's any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Oh, Lauren, yeah, I think I'm in a very small house, I'm afraid. There's a lot of people storming around. But um, there's a question from Ian Wilson that ties into this slightly mm -hmm. about uh, pressure from labels. So if we can mm -hmm. get Ian up, please. Hi. Hi. Um, it's not so much linked to the mental health side of things, although I'm sure you could kind of uh, could link it very, very much. Um, as an established artist, did you or do you still feel much pressure from management or labels in terms of composing your music and producing music to reach, you know, the biggest audience? Or do you do you feel, did you feel that at the start of your career? Um, do you feel it now, or are you quite are you quite free to make the music that you want to make? Um, so it's a really good question, Ian. Actually, I felt it quite acutely at the start of my career. And it's it's so funny. I felt it because, well, the first record just blew up. And so because that happened, suddenly um, there was just the basic practicality of the fact that uh, that sort of huge success um, meant that um, Mike, my producer, and, you know, he did brilliantly. Like, he ended up building this around the indie label that he created called Dramatico. And so, you know, suddenly you know, the selling of these records meant that something like 14 people had full-time jobs, mm -hmm. which is amazing, you know, and, and these people were my family and they were my friends. And so on that level, yeah, you kind of, you did feel the pressure of it, of having to sort of replicate the success levels of those early records. Um, but you know what I have found? That's something that we don't sort of subscribe to anymore at all. I mean, like no jokes to sell records and get to number one, great side effect, you know, never be sort of ungrateful for that. However, it's just not the priority. So like now I work with a management company where, you know, people use culture a lot to describe sort of businesses, but, you know, and I guess I will use that sort of lazy term. Um, it is about the culture and it's a kind of about the philosophy of how the team uh, describe who they are, you know, and what they believe in. So like, for example, you know, with my current management, the belief is very much about, first of all, everyone's health is absolutely the top priority, you know, like goes without saying. Um, and then it's about long-term goals, you know, and really building a long-term legacy. And yes, of course, it'd be great to, you know, do good sales, but it's just not the number one mm. priority because you know it ends you end up breaking which is what happened to me um so once you decide to make that the philosophy you know and when when you've got a group of people that subscribe to it then uh you end up creating goals you know and ways of achieving that uh that sort of facilitate it so for example i mean i remember when i first started working with summit he wouldn't talk to me on the weekends and I'm thinking, wow, like he's a music manager and he, cause he's got three daughters and he's a dad. And so he has to have his evenings off and the weekend off. And it's like, well, yeah, why shouldn't it be that way? You know, why do we think that in the music industry, everyone has to be on call? Like everyone's a doctor, you know? And, you know, I think the music industry is sort of, I don't know, I've observed it waking up a bit and becoming a bit more adult. Um, Whereas, you know, when I first started, and it's not like, you know, it's anything against any people, but I think there was just a culture of, you know, this is such a big deal, you know, we're taking over the world, this is music, that, um, well, you know, if there's some emergency on the weekend, you know, we need to talk, but I find that's not the case anymore. 
and it's you know and I feel lucky that I'm in in that type of culture and philosophy where you know we have weekends off yeah. and it means also that you you retain some form of regular life you know and you kind of get a sense of what people are living like you know you're not living in some cloud in the music industry that isn't part of the real world um and so so you can really do that thing that I was referring to earlier which is passively working which is taking in culture taking in modern life seeing what people are getting excited about not you know like without you know making it too sort of strategic <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. So actually, another, another thing I can just add to that, Ian, is that um, one of the ways that we uh, make sure we don't put pressure in the system is, so I work with my management team and I work with a brilliant label called BMG. Uh, and the reason why I call them brilliant, or one of the reasons why I call them brilliant is because, well, they are. Uh, the people that work there are really great, but we only have like one album contract. Uh, right. So we don't do sort of, five album contracts six album contracts and i believe that is becoming the norm across the board i believe i mean uh yeah i mean i think if you've got a good manager um you will hopefully but also it depends on your negotiating powers but i'd say that's the sort of way to do it brilliant thank you very much pleasure great so um do you have any plans for the future at this point because I know you were due to go on tour in September, mm. September, I think. Is it for the new? I was, I um, know. And we have a, a German summer tour book right. for 2021. And we have all our fingers crossed for it. Um, but future plans, well, look, I mean, you know, I feel lucky that we have records that sell and people that stream music and there are people that still want to hear music. You know, there's no shortage of it. Like one thing I felt, throughout the pandemic was this great desire for new music. And, and the reason why that was an odd thought for me is because I've always grown up adoring sort of traditional music, you know, in records from the 60s and 70s, you know, like the band, The Grateful Dead, Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan. Um, but finally, I was like, oh, I feel like I've rinsed all those records now. I need some new stuff. So I just want to, you know, keep making records and, uh, so yeah, I mean, I will. I I want to do that till till I can't. <laughs> well, and you have you done a live streamed gig? Mm. You have. Yeah, which was so great because it felt incredibly special. You know, it just really mobilised us on like a different level because it just became so much more meaningful. Um, and yeah, I did it at the Riverley Ballroom, which is an iconic building in East London and Charlie Lightning directed it. And it felt so good to play the new songs, you know, live on yeah, my band. Beautiful. I mean, we, you know, the plan was to tour this album and promote it like you always do. Um, but of course we've not been able to do that. And and so when you, when we did get to do it, it just felt really great. Um, uh, so last question now until we uh, move over to Nina and Polly, I think. Uh, just finishing off on quite a fun one. I've heard you're quite a thrill seeker. <laughs> I know you've been, well. you've been skydiving a fair few times and you did quite a, a special world record setting gig, if I'm right. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a bit I about did. that? Yeah, so this was, I think after the my first record came out, um, which did, you know, really well. And so we got a phone call from Norway or my management got a phone call from Norway saying that there was a, a, a gas station, sort of a gas platform off the coast of Norway in the Black Sea. And they wanted to put on a special event. Um, and the one of the managers on the platform who worked there, one of the gas rig workers, was a jazz pianist and that he was a fan of that first record I released. And would I consider doing a concert at the bottom of the ocean, basically, in one of the legs of this gas rig? And... Um, I mean, you know, I was always into nature. And so the thought of kind of, you know, something that is, you know, essentially an oil platform um, was a little bit weird, but I just thought, well, there's people there that are working and, you know, and, and this guy, he's a musician. So why not? Let's just try it. Let's do it. 
uh, thankfully the band agreed. And um, yeah, we, I mean, it was quite bizarre. We had to train uh, to be able to escape a helicopter that falls into the ocean because they tend to do that quite frequently. Um, that was a helicopter that was lowered into a swimming pool, got turned upside down. We had to break through the window under the, well, under the, in the swimming pool. <laughs> and then we also had to like train in um, doing an evacuation, which is these sort of metallic lifeboats that they have on the top of the gas rig. And then basically if the gas rig goes on fire, uh, they get released, these uh, lifeboats get released. And so you sit in what feels like you know, a crazy roller coaster, and you fall something like 30 meters, I think. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. You know what, all this sort of technical advancement was amazing for the training, but the lift to actually go down to the bottom took 10 minutes. That's so um, yeah, that was quite bizarre. Great, well, um, thank you very much for talking to us. We'll have you back after Nina and Polly have had a chat just to do some questions and talk about your new podcast oh, cool <laughs> thanks great Laura. well thanks very much uh, we'll switch over now. thank you hello hi. hi nina how are you good how are you yeah very well thank you awesome so um just a reminder for everyone watching as well if you have any questions just go for polly just go ahead and put them in the question q a chat um but we can just start off by uh if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself um your origin story and then um how you found success in your career and how that sort of blossomed sure um well firstly thank you so much for inviting me to talk today it's really lovely to kind of get the opportunity to speak to people who are kind of um looking at getting into the music industry for their career um so my name is polly scattergood i'm a singer songwriter musician um, I, I guess I started when I was about 14 years old, I got my first manager, um, and I moved up to London when I was 16 to go to the Brit school. Um, so I've been in music pretty much the majority of my life. Um, I've had four albums out in total, three under my own name and one under a side project, um, called On Dead Waves. Um, so I studied at Brit School for a year, um, no, sorry, two years, <laughs> which is where um, where I met Katie and lots of other um, wonderful artists that I'm sort of still friends with now. Um, and whilst at uh, Brit School, I, um, I found a, a manager who came and auditioned, much like Katie described her uh, sort of experience with Mike um, coming to the school to audition. And, we had a similar experience. Somebody came in uh, to the school. He began managing me, um, and um, and then when I left Brit School, um, I I was aware that I needed to kind of find something pretty quickly because I was kind of slowly running out of money. So I phoned up pretty much every single like publishing company and record company that I could. There was a little um, like book in the library which had. A, it, all of the names and numbers of uh, sort of everyone in the industry and I phoned up every single one asking if I could have a meeting with them and literally nobody would see me until I got to see which was Chelsea Music Publishing <laughs> and he let me come in and have a chat to him and um, and he then put me in touch with a um, with a, a little label uh, based in Leatherhead sort of running out of a garden shed and I signed to them for a single uh which was it was exciting you know i'd never done anything like that before and um and i yeah i was sort of with them for about a year making the single and there was sort of talk about there possibly being an album but whilst doing that i kind of continued to gig a lot in london mainly to sort of uh people who weren't really there to see me you know it would just be the classic kind of toilet circuit i'd turn up play a few tunes everyone would chat and stuff and and then i'd go home but um, luckily, um, there was a gig, uh, there were a few gigs where some labels came down uh, that my manager had invited and Mute, after one of the gigs in Kilburn at the 229, uh, one of the labels, Mute Records, uh, asked if I wanted to sign to them. Um, and then I, I ended up working with them for the best part of a decade, um, 
we released three albums, two under my own name and one under a side project name. Um, so yeah, that's kind of um, kind of my time with Mute. And then um, after that, I decided to uh, start my own label and release my own material. Um, so I put out my uh, fourth album last year in this moment. Um, and I kind of uh, really relished building my own ship. I, I, um, I have a manager, a different manager actually, to the one that I started with, his name's Roland Brown, and he very much sort of guided me into the idea of um, just being able to choose who I work with and how things come out. And so I kind of relished that opportunity. And um, yeah, so now I run, run my record label and have a little studio down on the Kent coast. And that's kind of me. <laughs> that's amazing, nice. Um, uh, I've listened to some of your tracks as well, and uh, you have a very different style. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw on your website that um, Music OMH has described you as like dark, complex, and visual, yet full of love. How do you find a balance between those two elements in your songwriting and production? Wow, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, when I go into writing a song, I don't tend to sort of think, oh, I have to have a balance between this and that. It, it sort of comes quite um, naturally, but I tend to write from experience. Um, I kind of feel like we're all very complex characters and, and I see no reason why music can't really reflect that. You know, I love, um, I love one of the first songs that I realized this was happening uh, with was um, the track Luca by Suzanne Vega, where there's this kind of really pretty melody, but it's a really very dark lyrically lyrical track. And I, I remember loving that when I was like 14 years old. And as I got older and kind of got into songwriting, I started kind of studying what it is about certain tracks that I love. And a lot of the things that I'm drawn to have quite pretty melodies, which on the surface you could put on and kind of would make you smile. And then when you listen to them, they have all these different layers and undertones. And I love things that you can listen to on one day and it means one thing and you can listen to on another and it just speaks to you in a whole different way. Um, so I think it, I think I try to sort of do that in my music, but not super consciously. I think it's just something that has kind of like seeped in over the years. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh I have some questions as well from Faith Benson that have been sent over previously, mm -hmm. um, sort of on the songwriting track um, and how much she wants to know how much you write by yourself and then with others co-writing sort of the um, the struggles and the differences in that as well, how often you write. So, I mean, when I was, uh, I started writing when I was about 11. Um, and I used to write almost uh, sort of obsessively every single day. I would go to school, I would write in my lunch break, I would come home, I would write constantly. Um, and as I've got older, I would say I've slowed down a little bit. Um, you know, when I, when I first went to Brit school, I had 800 songs kind of written. And now I would say I'm a lot more, um, I guess, uh, critical of my own process. Um, I go back over things and work and rework much more than I used to. Um, I I now, I mean, I, I'm mid thirties and I would say I, I've probably written thousands of songs, well into the thousands, but probably only about 50 of them have been released. You know, um, I think it's one of those things. It's like, it's like going to the gym. You have to keep going and keep working at it. But if you go too much, it, you can kind of burn out. So um i tend to um i i love writing with people as well that's something that i didn't used to do when i was much younger i, I was very focused on always writing as much as possible on my own um but i now realize when you work with other people other creative minds and other writers it's just the most magical thing when you kind of get this connection it's like it's like magic happens suddenly in the studio and um so yeah i i love i love writing with other people i would say i i try and do sort of at least two or three sessions a month with other people um i did have a regular thursday 
um, sort of uh, writing date with someone who um, who I was kind of working on a project with, and I really love the regular kind of contact. Um, I think it almost makes it a little bit more, um, you know, it's very easy to get distracted as a freelance and a musician. And if you have sort of a day where every Thursday afternoon you sit down and you write a song, I love that kind of idea. And also I've done some work as a mentor and working with uh, other younger musicians coming into the music industry, um, just working on their songs and co-writing with them. And I always try and set myself a goal that if we start at, say, 10.30 in the morning, that we have a completed song by the time they leave, whether that be 3 o'clock or 7 o'clock or 10 p.m. You know, it's like I always want everyone to leave with a finished song that they're really happy with. Um, I, don't, I don't tend to write to a formula when I do sessions for me, but when I work with other students uh, who are maybe slightly newer to songwriting, I often really enjoy, um, like, studying the tracks that they enjoy to get an understanding of what it is that they like. Is it, for example, like melody or structure or just sometimes people are drawn to, to a track because they love the drum sound on something. So I, I like to often pose the question, like, where do you where do you want this song to be played or where do you want the listener to hear it? Is it in a car or on the beach or at a party? And it, they're kind of seemingly simple questions, but they can really help you get a feel for where the person that you're working with wants to go and the sound that they want to create um I, I ask myself these questions sometimes before I start a session just for me you know because it just helps kind of focus your your mind on, on um what kind of a track you want to to create cool yeah um yeah that's really helpful um what is um could you maybe go in depth a little bit more about your process as well um, with songwriting and sort of exercises you might do, um, how you refine your um, songs, and then also maybe some of the programs that you rely on within your creative process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, if we start with the, the program question, <laughs> um, I, usually, yeah. I usually work on logic. Um, and I, but I tend to start just uh, on a piano or a guitar, um, just to kind of get a simple melody and structure in place. Um, so my process, that's such a wonderful question, because it's one of those things that you kind of just do. Um, I guess I, I'm quite an, a big advocate of t having tools in your tool bag. Um, I love a words list. I love language, you know, but I have a really terrible memory. So I tend to sort of write words down um, in my in my notebook that I can kind of just pull out when I get stuck for ideas. I love reading poetry and I love watching films and kind of um, anything that that takes you out of your own world and your own brain. I, I, lo I love the cinema, you know, for getting inspiration. Um, and for, for my process, I, I study it quite a lot in a really geeky way. You know, Katie sort of was talking about how you've got to kind of just really spend all, the, all your time doing it. Um, and it's not, it's not like work. I just enjoy, I, I enjoy like educating myself, studying syllables and how things rhyme and how things nearly rhyme and when sentences don't need that kind of rhyming thing to make maximum impact and just all these little details that kind of make up your craft um, and also looking into things like um, you know when when not to use words and when to just um, enjoy the silence because some genres don't need filling up with words you know sometimes the best sound is just silence and specifically actually with dance tracks being the artist that I am sometimes I get asked to do uh, guest vocals on dance tracks and stuff, which I really enjoy. But um, I tend to sit in the studio filling them up with lyrics and then I listen back and then I just cut them all out <laughs> because it just doesn't quite, um, it just doesn't work with the genre, you know? Um, so, I mean, sometimes it does, but often you just need to kind of edit yourself, um, which is something over the years I, I feel I've improved upon and hopefully will continue to do so. But um, yeah, I I think a lot of it depends on the genre that you're working in. But yeah, I tend to cut a lot of my lyrics out if it's like a certain kind of like a, a, a guest vocal or a dance track and stuff. 
Um, and I guess when I'm stuck for inspiration, like another thing that I go to as a tool is I tend to just take myself completely out of the space. Um, I find that the best way to sort of re-inspire you is by just completely not thinking about what you're doing because it's very easy when you're a musician and you love what you do as your job to just constantly be doing it and then get very frustrated when suddenly you can't do it because you have sort of a writer's block. Um, so I, I tend to just, um, I find like traveling and obviously we can't do that at the moment. So I'm kind of finding my escapism in um, books and films and um, I guess, you know, I, I've listened to lots of TED talks and just things that kind of take your mind to different places, which aren't necessarily focused on, on music. And often I find when you just allow yourself that downtime to completely reset, it can really help with, um, yeah, writer's block and, and can really help to re-inspire um, your process. Cool, yeah. Um, uh, I have a question actually that just came through from Shannon McCarthy. Mm -hmm. um, would Shannon like to come up and ask her question? If you could add her. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, hello. Um, I was just asking for like the people like myself who have a more spontaneous um, work style where things kind of come when they want. Um, how do you, do you have any advice for people who are trying to become more structured around things like deadlines and things? You, um, like with the producers, I'm sure they have um, like expected dates where we need something by the state really. Um, so trying to, especially in a creative role where you're dealing with ideas. Um, do you have any advice for trying to become more structured in your process, but flexible enough to allow that creative time to actually work? I mean, this is such an interesting question and it's, it's actually a struggle that I, I find this to be a bit of a struggle myself because you can't just, I mean, I find that you can't just suddenly turn on creativity. If you wake up one day and you have a deadline, but it's, you know you're not feeling it it's very hard to just kind of um make it happen but i think it's something that over the years i've tried to work really hard on and um, i remember very young because my my family my mum is an artist and my dad an actor so they were both kind of self-employed people who didn't really go into work at 9 a.m and finish at 5 they would kind of go whenever they had to and sort of work all night if they had to and I remember being told very young that I needed to get a structure to my day because I wouldn't be given that from anybody else. And I have kind of held on to that. My husband hates it because I kind of get up in the morning and open the curtains and like start the day almost as if you were going into an office or something. Uh -huh. um, but I think there's nothing like um, sitting down just giving yourself that that kind of time and space so we um we have a little studio um that's outside of the house we're lucky enough to have that space that we can go to and kind of call like going to work um but before that i mean at the moment because of lockdown i'm working from home and i've just made a little corner in one in a bedroom just that's my own and i would say if you can kind of dedicate a little space that's yours and even if it's like an hour a day and you sit there and you don't come up with anything but can I ask what kind of music is it that you that you work on um I'm all going to be quite experimental like a number of number of different genres mm -hmm. um so I'm into like rock and rap and hip-hop so I'm not yes. wanting to just stick to one yeah um yeah. so especially um and also with different languages as well because i'm interested in going foreign so having that time and like within the creative process i also have to separate right okay what am i doing today in terms mm -hmm. of what kind of music am i doing today and sometimes yeah. i don't put a name on it either if it just comes out the way it is it comes out the way it is much like how you said you don't focus on the balances it has to be this balance with this if it just comes out and it feels natural yeah it feels worse to stop it so Can I ask you, do you always work on your own or do you work with other people as well um oh, one second sorry my laptop's about to die no worries <laughs> um I mean I guess 
I, I'll answer that quickly while Shannon's finding her. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Things have changed so much since when I started. You know, when my first experience in the studio actually was at my um, my auntie uh, Elizabeth's house. Um, her name was Elizabeth Parker, and she uh, she used to work for the Radiophonic Workshop. She worked there for many many years. And she had recently moved her studio set up when it shut down from there into her home. And I remember her saying that you really need to sort of embrace um, limitations and sort of think outside of the box. And I've tried to always carry that spirit with me um, when working in the studio. But things have changed so much recently because when I started out, you know, I, I was in the studio, in the mute studio for four or five years making my first album. And I feel like that kind of studio time just doesn't, doesn't really exist anymore or maybe it does but just for very few people and I think so much of it now is about being able to kind of constantly create things and put things out which I don't think that's a bad thing I think that's just a new challenge you know it's a different way of working and um, I would say you know I I try to like diarize I live by like lists and diarizing my life and so I know what I'm doing for like morning and afternoon but I think if, there, if there's things that you need, if you're working with different genres, you know, maybe dedicate one day that you're working, you know, on Monday I work doing this, Tuesday I'm going to do this, Wednesday I'm going to do a co-write, Thursday I'm going to maybe go back and look at what I did on Monday and rework things so you don't go off in like 10 different directions, you know, maybe focus on like two or three and then um, I, I tend to get really like bogged down if I have... Um, a few different projects on the go because I don't know about you but my mind is always like whirring and even when I'm like cooking dinner for my daughter I'm kind of thinking about like oh what you know melody might go with this or a lyric might come into my head and I'm writing it down and then if I have too many different things on the go it can just get so like um all-consuming so I, I tend to to kind of focus uh, co try and compartmentalize things and even if it's like a one week is dedicated to this and another week is dedicated to that. And if you sit down in the week where you're supposed to be working on um, a specific genre and nothing comes, don't stress about that. You know, maybe watch some videos or, or listen to some music in that genre or read some books and just educate yourself more. And it just, you don't have to, I don't believe that it ever helps like forcing yourself to be creative on tap. Like I think that that's when, when, you know, it, it sounds forced. I think just enjoy being in that world without creating even if nothing comes from it you, you will have sort of educated yourself a little bit more and maybe heard some new music and um just yeah try and take the pressure off yourself a little bit is is would be my main advice I think brilliant thank you I think yeah focus is definitely one of those biggest issues um but I suppose like you, the way you've mentioned that reminds me of something else I've read on actually a language learning um advice so it's like you get repeating it at a specific time but you're approaching it from different angles so you don't feel forced and you don't feel like it's um confining you so mm -hmm. in the time where you would be doing that other genre if you can't make something then go listen to something I think that's brilliant advice thank you no worries. I um, I your music sounds fascinating. I can't wait to hear some at some point. Send me some thank things. <laughs> well, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon. Perfect. Um, I'm just gonna move on a little bit to um maybe the more of the um you've switched from being under a record label or being under a different management company to um releasing under your own um your own label. So I was wondering how that transition uh, affected you and how that went. Well, um, as Katie kind of mentioned, when she <laughs> when when she kind of took took things into her sort of control, it was a it was a big life changing eye opener. Um, you know, I worked with Mute for, for um, three albums and we had a brilliant relationship and they I think a lot of people say like is it better to have a record label or is it better to go independent and it's it's one of those questions which you can't answer because it all depends on the team that you're working with um 
I was lucky, so lucky to have landed working with Mute because they have a very tight knit, brilliant team who are basically, you know, 100% focused on the music and, um, and the art. And so we had a brilliant time making records together, you know, um, and it was very much my edu. I never went to university. I would have loved to have studied music production and kind of gone further into that. But I feel like being signed to mute and being in the studio and, and having Daniel Miller kind of like mentor me and, and show me the ropes, it, that was my education. Um, but I decided to go, um, not solo, <laughs> um, I decided to kind of break away after the third album um, and make my own record label. And I think the reason that I wanted to do that, I mean, it was a f there were a few things after, um, I felt quite, so my second album, Arrows, uh, came with quite a lot of pressure um, from my old management and just what was kind of expected of it. And I knew in my heart that I was kind of quite an indie artist. Um, and I think I wanted to, and then I did a side project on Deb Waves, which was still with me, um, which was really joyous and a, and a very arty experience. But the, for in this moment, which I knew was going to be my own record under my own name, I wanted to be able to kind of choose when it came out. I think that was one of the, the big things for me. Um, I felt like I didn't want to be... Um, I didn't want to be told like, oh, it's going to be out in spring and then have to wait, you know, because of paperwork or whatever for it to come out in September. And I wanted to be fully in control of the art um, and who I was working with, uh, you know, as a producer and and the final mixes, just every single part of the process. <laughs> um, I kind of, in terms of the art, was something that I... Um, it wasn't like me ever said I couldn't be part of that and I was part of it with my previous records but I wanted to have more control over it I guess um, I was a little bit older and and also financially it made a lot more sense to me to uh, give myself the deal <laughs> where I get you know a better cut of the income because you know I'm working in a field you know I'm, I'm an indie artist and I will always be you know fairly underground and, and indie and so you've got to be clever with um, with where you invest your money and what um, and realistic, you know, set realistic goals. Because I think when I was much younger, you know, everyone starts out thinking, you know, that there's just like infinite, uh, an infinite pot of money. And I think back in the day when I started, there probably was a lot more sort of out there. And but I think now I kind of relish working within slightly smaller kind of budgets but being able to choose where I put that um money into and for example for for in this moment I wanted to make a short um film that accompanied the record and this was not a particularly financially safe thing to do but it was my artistic decision and I wanted to invest my money in doing in doing that um so I did and um yeah it was just the idea of steering my own ship and I was lucky because I I was working I still had a really great team you know I had a, a I have a manager Roland Brown who sort of um really held my hand throughout the whole process um I was working with a great marketeer um Matt Dixon and um Republic of Music down in Brighton they kind of they acted in many ways, you know, they distributed the whole thing, you know, and they did all of the things which I would have kind of had no idea how to even begin with. They got the, the record cut and made some beautiful vinyl and um, kind of connected me with all the people that, that I would need to, to speak to. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a team effort still, even though I'm kind of doing it on my own, but they're just very different ways of working. Um, the nice thing about having a record label is you've kind of, you know, if something comes up and you don't have time to do it, you can kind of send off an email and hope somebody else will help you with it. But the, the, for me, at where I am right now in my career, I felt like doing it the way that I'm doing it is the, the most, um, yeah, it's the, it's the best way for me to be able to create records that I really want to make on a time scale. 
them whenever I want to release them and um, and kind of be in charge of how the, how the money comes in as well. Nice, yeah, it's really, um, it must be really nice to have that creative freedom now. Um, I've got a question from Alex Dye, so I'm gonna have him uh, come up and ask his question. It's more about songwriting as well. Cool. Hi, um, how do you compose your songs? You've obviously done like a lot of writing, but how do you make sure you remember like melodies and lyrics and chords? Do you record demos or is it all from memory or do you write it down or what goes on? Uh, so uh, it's a real mixture. I, I find the best ones stick in your head. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I have a really shocking memory. So I, I, I'm one for using my iPhone voice notes. Um, if something comes into my head, generally I find melodies come into my head when I'm driving or when I'm really not thinking about trying to write a melody. So I'm, I have like hundreds of voice notes on my phone where I'm humming things or singing in a melody. I, um, I write, I, I would say to anyone watching this, it's worth writing your stuff down in books as well as laptops because I've had a few laptops stolen over the years and it's just like heartbreaking. Just back everything up onto hard drives and write everything down, lyrics, melodies in books as well. So when inevitably that laptop gets nicked, you have something still that you know you haven't lost all of that that work that you've put in um so yeah i tend to to write um i i i didn't used to be very good at it but now i very much put things like put things down when i hear them especially into my voice notes because we're so lucky to have this technology nowadays that you can just have something in your bag that is there and can con i remember when i wrote cocoon for my second album, it was kind of before, I didn't ha even have an iPhone at the time. And I remember I had to phone up, I had like one of those old school phones and I had to phone up my home landline and leave a voicemail <laughs> on the bus for the melody. So when I got home, I could remember the melody on the answer machine. And it's just like, you know, when you look back how, how things have changed, it's just incredible, but we're super lucky to kind of have everything at our fingertips now and um yeah and also be so portable you know like some of the most wonderful producers i've worked with don't work in a studio they have um portable setups so you can kind of take take your setup and go anywhere and um i don't know how you uh, how do you tend to work do you have one specific setup or um, you take it so i've obviously i use my laptop quite a bit and then yeah. i'll write lyrics down in a notebook yeah amazing yeah it's it's i think having the laptop being so portable is amazing because um you know the room that you're working in we're lucky enough to have a studio now that my husband's been ages moving sort of panels around and trying mm -hmm. to balance but i i love taking the laptop and going like we went to berlin set up in a hotel room and we worked a lot on headphones you know because then you're not in um if the room isn't quite right or you don't really know the sound of it it doesn't matter because you've got your headphones on and you can kind of work in that way until you can get to a balanced room and i think there's nothing like being in a space that inspires you i would choose that any time over like a big shiny studio um space it's all about vibe for me and um and being portable is such a, a brilliant thing that we kind of can do um can do now and yeah just ha have things on our phones and our in in our laptops and stuff so yeah it's it's exciting so you're a singer songwriter uh i i work with nina quite a bit for songwriting um, nina's the singer i can't sing <laughs> oh, cool. Cool. so what kind of style do you guys do uh so at the moment i'm making a indie rock album and nina's singing on it so we're writing it together wow. yeah that's really cool yeah. yeah how exciting it's and so and you're producing it as well yeah yeah so i'm doing all the recording all the mixing and all that kind wow. of stuff that's that's really yeah it's exciting it's nice when you can shoot when you have like a whole project and you know that it, this is going to be an album yeah. i love that concept because i think we often listen to tracks especially because of spotify and stuff you just listen to one-off tracks you know but i know for and in the gaps between my albums i've sometimes done like guest vocals on one track and then something another project that's maybe one or two tracks but when you get your head into the mindset of okay i'm gonna do a complete album now it's such a um a brilliant way of working and it and the whole project it's like 
yeah, just just watching it kind of flourish from like a seed into something really special. That I think within this moment, that was one of the things that I that really opened my eyes doing it myself. You know, it was when I worked with um, the the um, Matt Dixon. He he said to me like, "What do you want this project to be? Think of yourself as a brand." You know, and I I think this applies if you're a writer, a label, whatever. You know, an artist. If you think of yourself as a brand and kind of think, does your art fit your sound does your logo reflect who you are does your like photography and social media reflect the projects and even down to like the details of like the colors um you know with my last record it was quite earthy and dark so i chose to use like a color palette that was reflective of that like dark blues and deep reds and then for the remixes i would go more bright and electric and i think you know just yeah having that um kind of goal of a complete project a complete album it's such an exciting place to be so yeah good luck with it brilliant thank you <laughs> thanks alex no thank you much. awesome um uh, i just have another question as well from dave sure. um our our beloved dave um he said you featured on the reworked version of video killed the radio star and he wants to know how that came about so that was um, my dear friend, Bruce Woolley, who is just the most incredible songwriter um, and a real joy to be in the studio with. So he he was working with um, a friend of mine, Daniela, um, and he reached out and, um, and asked if I would like to um, uh, be part of this reworking of Video Killed the Radio Star. And this is a track which I specifically remember listening to in art class when I was like about 15 and loving. And it used to be played all the time, you know, it was like constantly on the radio. And um, and to have him reach out and ask if I wanted to do a reworking of it was just super exciting. And then when we, when we, um, when we kind of met up and put our heads together, it just became this really um, exciting project which um which kind of blew my mind because bruce is his is such a genius he kind of has these ideas that and they're always really elaborate <laughs> but you you want to achieve them because he's got this just this energy and this passion when he's in the studio that is so um addictive you just want to kind of make it happen and see what will happen so we started recording um he'd sort of done some uh ideas for the production uh, with his son Kit and they were working together in the studio and and I came and did this kind of floaty vocal over the top and then we worked together on um, just ideas like layering up the vocal and making it almost like a robot but with feeling <laughs> you know um, so it was very very different to the original track but it was so I felt like when I he sent me the lyrics to it on its own and it just brought this like depth to it which when I was younger and I listened to it on the radio I would hear it in one way and then when I started really pulling apart all the elements of this song that he had written I mean it was just mind-blowing what you know like how it on so many different levels it kind of like um appealed and so yeah we recorded that and then we made a video together because he has this um sort of wonderful uh, array of different characters that he works with um and i was became one of the kind of um crazy characters one of the um characters in his video which was really fun and again it was very um it was it was all just about the art we didn't really have any idea what the out you know what the outcome was going to be but we just had a lot of fun playing with um with effects and kind of combining um Sort of using um sort of graphics in the videos and then me and um yeah we just had a lot of fun with it really and uh and then the final result was yeah this crazy cover which um which we both really enjoy and and it's been remixed and had, had some really lovely remixes as well so yeah it was brilliant uh and very interesting project and he's actually really fascinating i would urge you to go and look at his catalogue and the people that he's worked with because um yeah, he's, a, he's had a fascinating career, so it was a, a total honor to work with him. Nice, yeah, awesome. Um, uh, I guess I can go back to one of the questions I had, and then there's another mm -hmm. one that I have to ask. Um, but 
I noticed also on your website that you include stems to your songs as downloadable. Um, and sometimes that's really unique because some artists don't want to give that up to like, you know, like they don't want to like release that, but others are like really excited to like release stems to their music. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering how that sort of affected you and if you get a lot of remixes back um, or if that is uh, helpful to you as I guess a marketing standpoint as well. It's a, it's an interesting question because I, um, when, uh, so Matt Dixon, who I work with suggested it. And when he first put the idea out there, I was like, I'm not sure I can do that because I feel like there's something very magical when you like give somebody a finished record, there's something really magical about like that and not allowing them to see all of the kind of like skin and bone underneath it. <laughs> um, but then the more I thought about it, I thought, do you know what? There's a lot of people right now, especially with everything going on, who are sitting at home, who maybe have a bit more time on their hands because they've been furloughed or, you know, uh, just have a lot of things going around their mind with what's going on in the outside world. And for me, in my life, I've always found music just to be the most perfect way of escaping everything. And I... And it was just before Christmas and I thought, you know what, isn't that a pretty awesome gift to put the stems out into the world? And then anybody who wants to can look at them and dissect them and see how the track was made up. But also if they wish, they can play with them and put their own stamp on it and be, you know, turn it into their own piece of music. And I love, the more I started thinking about it, I was thinking, actually this could be really cool um because I, I do enjoy the remix process a lot but normally you just send it to you know a few key remixes that you kind of select and but I just thought do you know what I'm gonna stop um try sort of being so protective over what I've done and I'm just gonna allow this track out as stems that people can just download for free hopefully remix and make their own creations from and then send back to me and one of the things that I like about it as well is it's not like a competition there's no like winners or losers but what is nice is when I hear a really good one because I've been sent some like the connections that I've made with some of the people who have remixed you know I've started following all these musicians that I wasn't aware of who have just made these incredible like pieces of music with something that I had sort of given them and it's a really cool way of connecting firstly with like um you know people that other artists who are doing similar things and because I have my own sort of way of releasing I can also if I want to release some of them um through you know we haven't yet kind of chosen exactly how we're going to do it and when and stuff but there's definitely a, a fair few which are, are super good and, and of releasable quality and it, it would be really nice to kind of like put them back out into the world you know and so it's just a nice way of kind of um rounding off the circle and just I think in this day and age especially like there's so much like negativity around social media but I think there's so many positive things to be had as well and if we can kind of share you know things and and I, I always think if you if you offer people things they and they offer you things back it's just the most like perfect way of working especially as artists it's, that's how we work right it's <laughs> it's kind of key so um yeah I mean it started off as a kind of um an idea and it's turned into this really lovely sort of um project and it's just sort of positive creative exploration I guess it's fun that's really cool yeah I, I really like the positive aspect that you brought to that because sometimes uh that doesn't really more like music is more competitive rather than collaborative so that's really cool yeah um yeah uh, I have another question from Corbin so I'm gonna have him come to the floor and ask his question okay Hi, Corbin. Uh, your mic is off. <laughs> Hi there, can you hear me now? Classic yeah. rookie mistake there, yeah. good job. Um, <laughs> my question was just, how, how did your approach to writing change uh, when it came to sort of being paired with James Chapman for On Dead Waves? And like, what was there anything unexpected that, that was, was different about going from being a primarily solo artist to then sort of being in more of a group session? Well, I mean, the On Dead Waves album was just the most 
it's probably one of the most joyous albums I've made. <laughs> um, so I worked with James uh, initially when he was doing his own solo um, project. He still is Maps. Um, and I was doing my own solo stuff. We were both on mute and we did a gig together at the Roundhouse in Camden, um, which uh, was set up by Daniel Miller, who runs Mute Records. And he suggested that we both did each other's songs in the style of our style. Um, so we that's kind of how we first met and we were put on stage together. And there was this instant, I mean, there was a, a great chemistry when we were on stage, but we instantly kind of had a connection um, just in terms of, life and being friends you know we had a lot in common and um what well, after arrows came out which was my second record uh i um i finished with my then manager and got um and had a period of time where i was kind of a little bit i don't want to say lost because that sounds really negative but i was just a bit confused as to what the next like move forward was and i find in those times that friends and and artists are like, you know, they're, they're the angels that we need when we're, you know, sort of unsure of where to go. And um, and so I was speaking to him and he said, I'll oh, come, come up and let's just, you know, write some songs together. And I went up to stay at his house and basically didn't leave. <laughs> um, so I think I went up for like a night and stayed for a week and then went home for like a couple of days and then went back up again. And as we were writing the chemistry, I think what, what we both enjoyed was not neither of us being in the spotlight because I didn't, um, when I started out, I didn't really want to be a solo artist. I actually wanted to be a songwriter. Um, and I think both me and James suffer a little bit from stage fright and, and we have a like a weird love hate awkwardness with being on the stage and, and we both really love being in the studio so it worked very well um in terms of um the dynamic um we both allowed each other the space to do what we enjoy like i i really love lyric writing and and um top lines and he's very like wonderful at making the most majestic like sounds and production and um songwriting and he was very good at editing me when i you know would come up with a bad line and you know, we were, we were very honest with each other, which I think maybe came from doing the gig together all those years ago, because you always have to be quite honest, don't you, when you're thrown together in a collaboration. Um, so, yeah, it was a different experience, but I, I loved not, I loved actually not being the front person. I loved sharing that pressure because um, it suddenly felt like it was more um, manageable, you know, everything felt more manageable when you have somebody sort of who's equal equally invested and equally part of it and just somebody to bounce off and and I would actually say that's a really nice if you are a solo artist and you're watching watching this it's it, even if you just get a producer that you really trust or somebody else who can be part of the process that is as invested in it as you are it, it definitely helps, you know, um, for vibe and spirit and mentally and everything. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing. I think a lot of the difficulty from, I, I guess, a lot of people in the same sort of situation that I've come into where I've, I've started is just doing everything on my own in my bedroom and then suddenly being yeah. thrust into university where there's lots of people to collaborate with. It can be sometimes difficult to understand how that collaboration space works initially. But yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> No worries. I, I would say with the university thing as well, like I, the same thing happened to me at Brit school, you know, we were thrown together with loads and loads of different people and you kind of want to make it work with everyone, but it doesn't always. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the great thing is, is with everyone, even the ones that don't work, I feel like you kind of learn something with each, each session that you do, even when they don't kind of work. And it is amazing. I think college is just the best or university is the best time to kind of you make these friends and even if you think, do you know what, I'm in a completely different world. There was a girl who I went to Brit school with who I was a completely different genre with. You know, we didn't really work together that much at, at school. She had an amazing voice um, and I was really into songwriting, but they were two kind of different. We were working in different worlds. But now, sort of 15 years later, we've kind of gone full circle and we're working in not similar genres, but doing, she runs her own label and I'm doing my own thing. And, you know you suddenly find that these people that you met all these years ago 
are still in that world and doing doing similar stuff. So just um, I would say, yeah, make friends with everyone. <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> yeah. right, thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you, Thank Corbin. You. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I think that we're kind of running up on on time a little bit. So um, I'm just gonna. Uh, thank you for having this talk between you and me and I'll just welcome Lauren and Katie back up and we can talk a little bit about um, your relationship together and how you guys are building like a podcast and stuff. Brilliant. Awesome. Hello. Sweet. Hello. Hey. Cool. Um, so maybe just talk about uh, sort of how I know you you both met at the at school and everything, um, but maybe I know you're starting a podcast and everything. So I would just wanted to give we, we we just wanted to give this time to see if you had anything to say about that. Do you want to go? I, I mean, it's uh it's something that we've been talking about a lot, but I think it was something that a lot of artists and a lot of people are being asked, you know, to start podcasts because they're just a very popular form of conversations um and i've been asked separately by my team i think polly had been asked separately by her team and then i think we just decided let's just do it together you know so that we can you know make it like i guess a conversation between friends you know from very different perspectives of the you know we've always actually gossiped about the industry haven't you polly <laughs> i think that's how it came about i think we were having one of our many long you know, hour and a half long conversations where we were like putting the world to rights and talking about, you know, what we were reading and what we were kind of listening to and stuff. And after it, uh, somewhere along along in that process, we thought, you know what, maybe we should record because we would all, both of us would sort of come away from these conversations. Uh, I'm, I know I especially would feel really renewed having talked to another, you know, musician doing a similar thing. Um, just having somebody else's input, um, I think it's just such a special thing, isn't it? When you can um, talk openly with people mm. and the idea of putting that down in a podcast and and kind of learning, like me and Katie have both always been real geeks when it comes to like wanting to understand what we're doing and educating ourselves and stuff. And it's amazing when you speak to other musicians and, and get their how they the way that they write because everyone is so different and so yeah it's exactly about that about looking at the detail of songwriting and how people create so we've had a number of brilliant guests on the podcast isn't out yet um uh, but we'll let you know when it is out you know through our social media and you know all the rest of that um but yeah it's just interesting to kind of look at how people create and one on one of the first episodes we spoke about the impact of space and the environment that you create in I, I know Polly touched upon that in the chat earlier yeah I mean that that actually is one of the episodes that really read now when I sit down I keep thinking like is this <laughs> is this the space <laughs> but um, it was amazing um hearing how how people's space kind of seeps into their music um the person specifically that we were speaking to wrote a lot of their compositions in B flat minor because the sound of the road outside their flat was in B flat minor, the building works that they were doing. And, and I just, I find these little facts because we, we, we turn on our radio or whatever and we hear these finished songs and it's like done. But it's just amazing when you hear these little kind of uh, bits of treasure that have kind of gone into making up the, the final product um so we really try and pick apart each each piece of music and each artist that comes on on to to speak to us it's just interesting hearing their process and really pulling apart how they do it and kind of getting our heads inside of it um i know that you know each other quite well but would you have any questions for each other about your careers that you haven't previously talked about or anything that's come up in these calls that you well know. actually um there was some things you said probably in your talk that i found that i didn't know about you like you know the advice that your parents gave you which was to set your that no one is going to task you with what you need to do as a creative so i've, I've learned mm. something new today which is really cool um yeah do you know it's, it's interesting i feel like i've learned <laughs> <laughs> <Get> into these <laughs> 
crazy situation. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we. Well, I have a question for you, Paul. What are you excited about the most right now amongst your project or what you're working on? Well, I think this year I'm excited about um, one of the earlier questions actually was from the person who was doing lots of different projects. And, and last year I dedicated myself to my album. But this year I've got a few different projects on the go, including the podcast. And, and I'm working with a few different people in kind of slightly different genres. And I'm quite looking forward to... Um, to kind of being able to uh, experiment with different sounds again and and not be sort of um, tied to making a complete album. But, you know, me, we've talked quite a lot, haven't we, about how the, the model has changed slightly over the years and how it's quite important now to release things regularly, um, uh, just to, to kind of keep things going. And I always did the opposite. I would make an album, put it out, disappear and write something. But, this year, I've kind of consciously for I've consciously made the decision to to make a schedule for myself and make sure that I keep releasing things and keep working on things and don't kind of let things kind of uh, disappear off into the ether. How about you, Kay? What what are you excited about? This year? Um, I okay. So me and management have decided to call twenty twenty one the year of fun. <laughs> what? And so that basically means like. Uh, nothing too serious nothing too like mm -hmm. you know like no no huge pressure no kind of you know very sort of uh important feeling works and just collaborating with artists it's something mm -hmm. i've really not done a lot of so i want to work with you know different artists and um, just get a sense of how others work um i'm also looking at like how stories are created and there's one project which uh, is going to be about inventing in that field. You know, like I find it fascinating how the story is often, you know, when you get taught how to tell a story, you often get um, referred to the uh, hero circle, you know, in that pattern. And, you know, I'm curious as, as to, well, why is there usually just one hero? You know, like, where did that come from? What's the history of the development of the story? And, so yeah, there's there's lots of research areas that I'm you know getting excited about. Can I ask uh, one more quick question? <laughs> um, so the the um, cover art that you did for your last album that you shot yourself, the obviously this year, hopefully the year of fun that we're about <laughs> to have, but we've all <laughs> we've all had to kind of rework the way that we work. You know, even doing something like this over Zoom, we would never not Zoom. Sorry, the the re, Remy Rimmer. Um, Reem, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, we would never the Remo program. We would never have like thought about doing this a few years ago, would we? But you had to sort of completely because my album was kind of finished when lockdown happened. But you were still right in the creative process, so you had to shoot all your own artwork, didn't you? Yeah, the front cover had to. Be. Well, uh, it was a lady at the record company who teamed me up with a brilliant photographer called Rosie Matheson. And she's a film photographer, so film as in, you know, uh, films that get developed. So you don't, it's not a digital camera, you don't actually see what you're, what you're um, filming. And she sent me her Mamaya camera, which is this huge camera, very weighty, looked like a giant wow. beetle, it was beautiful. <laughs> and um, yeah, she taught me how to load it with film, how to measure the light, how to focus the camera and how to shoot. And so, yeah, so I got to, I got to do it like that. And I loved it. And actually, after I gave the camera back, I thought this is a really interesting medium. And so I bought a camera from Japan and now I've been taking photos sort of on my days out. Wow. I'm excited to see them. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I think it's, that's the great thing about, you know, all the things that this pandemic is making us do and learn. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, for sure. Nice, yeah. Um, I think we're going to move to the Q&A questions, um, like sort of open it up to the floor a little bit more um, for both of you. And I think John Wood has a question. Um, I'm not sure if John wants to come up, though. Let me. Um, I've just got like two questions that kind of meld into one, really. Um, and so they it's um, how do you both approach the harmony side of your songwriting as opposed to the song lyrics? And with that, 
Um, what do you tend to write first, your music or your lyrics? Do you want to go first, Kate, or shall I? I don't mind. Time? Do you want me to go for I can go first. Um, so I think the beautiful thing about making records is because it's creative, you know, and because there are so many brilliant people working in the field, you can kind of do anything. So, for example, my harmonic skill set is definitely not in the advanced stage, which means I go to specialists. So um, on the last record that I made, I was lucky to work with Leo Abrahams, who is a brilliant composer and producer, a great guitarist, um, with Sam Dixon, with Tim Harris, with my brother Zurab Meloa. And, um, you know, and so basically, you know, one of the things we looked at was how to paint the imaginary picture with the music and the harmony that the lyrics are, are painting. Um, you know, and so to look at, you know, is this song like a poem or is it like a movie? And if it's like a movie, like how do we immerse the listener in that experience? You know, and so I can really talk to you about harmony from that abstract perspective, you know, and then I'm lucky enough to work with specialists who can actually do it. You know, and that's because like my guitar playing is a little bit more like a classical musician. So, you know, put a a sheet of music in front of me and some chords, I can play it. But in terms of composing, I'm very slow when it comes to harmony. Um, so to me, it's more about the sort of, that kind of surreal artistic approach. I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, so that that's super interesting, Kate, the, the way that you go about it. And, and I would actually say I, in many ways, uh, approach it in a similar way, because I wouldn't say it's my sort of field of expertise. It's not the first thing that I would say um, I'm super good at, but I tend to work with other people, um, producers mainly. Um, I, I always work with Glenn Kerrigan, who um, who's worked on my last few albums, and he's wonderful with harmonies and melody. And um, but the way that I tend to kind of um, do it myself is I love um, tracking. I I work mainly with vocals when I'm trying to work out harmonies because I'm not particularly technical on the piano or guitar. I play by ear. Um, but I don't read music and um, I do everything by ear and so when I'm in the studio I tend to um, do a vocal and then I will do like track it but with a harmony on top or underneath it and sometimes I will even like sing um, like a bass line on a, a, as a vocal um, just to kind of like and, and then I create these layers usually all, all on vocals and then we sometimes go through it and put one of the vocals onto a synthesizer or, um, you know, or a piano or whatever. Um, but that, I basically have to do it by ear using my voice, track everything up and then put them onto the, put, put the different tracks on, onto different instruments in general. <laughs> cool. So what, what generally comes first, music or lyrics for you guys? Uh, for me, it's always, it's very often the lyrics. I often, I love hearing a line and um, I have, I have hundreds of notebooks where I've just like scribbled little lines that I hear and sometimes it will be from the most, you know, like walking down the street and you overhear somebody having a conversation and you <laughs> kind of write these lines down. Um, so it's usually for me a line, but um, it's either a line or together you, you, at the same time usually. Um, I also find them... Um... Sorry to interrupt, Paul. I also find that question kind of sort of arbitrary a little bit. I think it's what begins it is the spark. You know, it's like, what is it that hit you in the heart and you just went, oh, you know, I have to, I have to sit down and get this out. So, you know, and I kind of, I'd like to say that it's more than inspiration, um, but it is something that compels you. Mm. Yeah, it's like a, a moment of inspiration, isn't it? Um, and it, if only we knew exactly what it was, because that would be the, that would be the magic, wouldn't it? That would be the thing yeah. that everyone would be off. But do you know what I think is interesting? I think the reason why we don't know is because it's it's to do with what has already been. So, for example, you know, it could be one thing for me on a given day, and then that's it. I've used it up. So like I've used that 
spark of inspiration. And there's no, I can't, I can't write another I Cried For You or Spider Web or Piece By Piece. You know, it's like those songs are now created. You know, and again, what I might have learned from creating those songs might be of no use to Polly, you know, and, and vice versa. So I think we have to be mindful of the fact that we are, you know, the works are being created to, to in a linear um, sort of tradition of what has already been. Cool. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. Well, uh, well, I think we might have a new question from Faith. Um, I haven't really asked if Faith would like to come up, so I might just read this out. Uh, you guys have both written lots of songs. How do you go about choosing which songs to record? Or if someone has written a song and pitched it to you, how do you decide if that song is for you? I think that's what to say. Holly, do you want to go with this one? Um, I mean, I, um, I haven't yet um, been in a situation where somebody's completely recorded a finished song and pitched it to me. Um, I tend to, uh, I, I love the songwriting process, so I always kind of want to be part of it in some way. Um, but when it goes to choosing which tracks kind of uh, you, you want to release, for me, it's always about the, the whole album. And I know I mentioned this before, people tend to dip in and out of albums nowadays, but I'm still quite old school in that I really love the finished complete body of work. And so, for example, uh, on, on previous albums, I always overwrite. Um, so I'll work with different writers and, and myself and maybe we'll write 40, 50 tracks and out of them we might choose just 10 to go onto the, the record. And it, and it tends to be um, ones which tell the story of the record and, and have a, an overall feel that just kind of work with each other. And I've actually taken tracks off an album which I felt are really good because they just kind of like... Um, kill the, the movement of the record you know so if you put them in and they just don't fit anywhere and so sometimes I think okay well I'm going to keep that for something different I might keep that and send it in for like a sync opportunity or or pitch it to another artist so that nothing's ever wasted but um but I do tend I like to focus in on the project that I'm working on and and overwrite and then kind of um uh edit myself to down to sort of 10 or 12 tracks I would say I completely agree too. It's it's about the whole, I guess it's about the body of the album having a concept, you know, that you sort of, uh, you know, what are the themes of this record? Um, things that Polly raised earlier, like where do you imagine people listening to it? Um, what kind of character do you imagine listening to it? Uh, you know, and then it's like, once you have those sort of decisions made, and then you kind of have them on your sort of imaginary wall, uh, they then help to guide you with all the millions of decisions you have to make as a creative. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say is I'd, I'd sort of refer back to um, what I mentioned earlier about courageously seeking honest critique, you know, so be brave, play it to people and, and encourage them to give you the truth. Um, but it's scary. <laughs> Do you know what, actually, that would be a, a huge thing I would completely agree with, that there is nothing better than finding a few people that you trust, mm -hmm. you know, to, like, really tell you as it is. Exactly. <laughs> um, there's nothing worse than putting things out into the world and then being judged by complete strangers, and so it's always, you always get a slightly, slightly refined kind of version if you send it to management or a friend or a family member or whatever. We can um, just be, be an honest critique. Okay. And uh, Faith, who asked the question, has said, um, do you make these decisions by yourself or is it a discussion with like the producer or whoever you're collaborating and writing with? I'd say that's a, that in itself is a creative aspect too. You know, so for example, on this last record, I worked with Leo Abrahams and there is always a question mark about exactly what a producer's role is. You know, you read... I don't know, Bob Dylan's biography or Daniel Lenoir's biography, you know, and they all have different concepts of what a producer is. Joni Mitchell won't be able to tell you what a producer does. And so when Leo started working with me, he was like, okay, my idea of a producer is that uh, 
I have to bring to life the vision of the artist. You know, and so there is a producer who is putting a lot of that on your shoulders, you know, which can be great for you or it can be a disaster for you, depending on where you are and what you want to do. Um, I tend to, for me, at the moment, I make pretty much all the decisions about the lyrics. Um, and then everything else, I'm quite happy to, you know, have a very sort of open table about it with the core group of people that I work with, whether it's my producer or even my, my musicians um, or my management. Yeah, I, I think I work in, in a similar way. Um, although my team have a joke that if I really like it, it will definitely be the one that no one else likes because I'm always... I always choose the really obscure ones, which I think are the really like fun, catchy ones, and then no one else really gets it. But I think um, I rely heavily on just a few, uh, like a core of people who I really trust their ears and their judgment. Um, I think there's a danger when you start, um, you know, ultimately, if there was something I loved and I wanted to release it, it would happen. But I think there's a danger when you write everything yourself, you work on it, for, for months, sometimes years, and then you, you you kind of lose, can easily lose the sort of end vision and, and lose perspective on it. And there's nothing like a fresh pair of ears that goes in and listens to something and goes, actually, I don't really, I can't really hear that. And sometimes you hear it. I also find if you play things to people while you're in the room, you hear it differently, you know, um, rather than when you're in the studio. And I think if you can get a small team of people you can send things off to for advice especially with like things like singles you know um the i i don't know what yeah what will work on certain radio stations that's not my field of expertise and so you know i'm lucky enough to have people who you know all about that stuff so they can kind of help guide great um faith has quite a lot of questions the lady that's just asked quite a few so i think we're going to bring her up just to ask a question if that's all right or two. Thank you. Uh, so define, so before you start the project, do you guys have conversations with the producer to define how your role is going to be with them and what you expect of them within their role so they can understand how to serve the song and also you guys as the artist as well? Polly, do you want to go on this one? No, you go first. Well, uh, kind of what I said before, uh, on the last record, my producer, Leo, um, he kind of, you know, came up with the answer to that question. I can't remember if I asked him, I was like, you know, okay, so you want to produce his record, so but what does that mean? So I think I, you know, we did have that conversation and it was really good to have it early on because it is, it's a very, um, that line is very ambiguous. Um, and then I sort of take the approach that, you know, once that decision is made and hopefully it's a good person that you've found and you're working with, you know, you have to give it your all. Um, so yeah, I would say that those are quite, quite important things, but yeah, defining what the producer is going to do and what you're going to do would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, I think it's really important. I mean, I'm massively... That ambiguous line <laughs> is quite is quite blurred for me because I ended up marrying my producer. So <laughs> there's a kind of um, unwritten uh, thing that we have where you know I I always uh, I possibly expect more from him than a produ than you would normally in an artist producer role. You know, and sometimes we've had to actually be very uh, aware of the lines being crossed because it can become um it can become if you're working with somebody that closely and a producer artist relationship is by nature super close anyway because you're just in the studio all the time working and even with um my stuff now like uh i always ask like do you want to do this project or are you doing this as my producer you know because you want to be part of it because if you don't that's fine you know um so it's i think it is really important for, for my for me when I go into the studio with the dynamic that I have I really I find it's it's imperative to have kind of the rules and the the um, idea behind the project set out before we even begin because otherwise it just gets way too complicated um, yeah I'm a big fan of an email when it comes to that <laughs> so 
So you guys kind of touched on my next question, but I was wondering if you could go a bit more in depth with it. So what do you guys personally look for within a producer or somebody that's going to work on your next track or your next album? What is it, the kind of qualities, the kind of experience that you guys look for? And then how about you go about approaching the producer or do they normally approach you? Um, okay, so, well, first of all, it helps to know that they really want to do the job you know, that they will prioritize it and that they will give it their all. Um, and then the second thing is making sure your philosophies align, you know, and that your expectations somehow align, you know, like if they, if they want to work with me because they just want to have their big hit, then that's philosophically not really going to align with where I'm at. I mean, I might be in that frame of mind for a certain project, but most of the time, that's not the goal. Like, it's more about experimenting, curiosity, um, storytelling, you know, really doing the best in the song form. And then the final thing that I would say I look for, and I actually clock that I really need this in a producer, and that's because Leo had it, is a sense of taste and style. So what I mean by that is, like, you know, it's about everything it's about the world that they occupy it's about their culture it's about what they listen to how they dress how they talk like who they know do they um digest art what kind of films are they you know like those little things and it's not like you know you get to uh uh you know fully take that on but you know you get little clues of it and so it informs the kind of person that is going to be entering your creative world and vice versa so that's the third thing I'd say. Yeah, I would completely agree with all of those things. I think um, the way that I have, uh, have approached it in the past when I've been working with different producers is I, I often tend to listen to their back catalogue as well. And the, everyone has different sounds, you know, the, the producers which I often don't go for are the ones which maybe have done one album in a certain genre and then something completely different in another genre because then I feel like I don't really know what I'm getting. I really enjoy, um, like I worked with Ken and Jolie and Thomas on Arrows and they had this, in all of their albums that they had produced, they all had this amazing warmth to them um, that was just like magic. They had this kind of sound, which I, I hadn't really heard anyone else make. And, and I think it, every single producer is so, um, will have their individual sound. I remember working with one producer who was really into making his own reverbs and I found that fascinating. You know, he would put his microphone, uh, thread it through like the um, the letterbox and put it in the, the doorway, the hallway of the warehouse that he was working in just to record the sound of like the the hallway and the metallic doors. And, and I think there are certain people that, um, that, spend so much time creating their own unique sound. Um, as a producer, I really like finding those people who who sort of go in for one thing. I, I'm not, I tend to not be that interested when people do lots and lots and lots of different things. I love finding one person who sort of knows who they are, has, has a certain sound that I can then go to and know that they will help me sort of create, create a sound that they know how to do, if you know what I mean. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Faith. Right. Um, um, awesome. So we have just one. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't mean to. Um, we are running over slightly into networking time. We're due to. Uh, just once this is over, mix a bit on the tables if that's all right with you. Quarter past. But there's one more question from Shannon. Um, each song is unique and personal. But do you prefer the songs you've written after a particularly difficult time, turning negative into positive, or from purely positive experiences? Um, I mean, I I tend to just write about all experiences. I think um, that I, I never listen back to my tracks. I, I know that the ones that I've written from particularly uh, tricky times in my life, I find very difficult to listen to um, with space. Um, 
I think I think it's always really important that you write from from the heart and from you know even if you're watching a film and and something like inspires you to me that's still writing from your heart if it makes you feel something um but I tend to yeah I, I don't have a preference in terms of the positive or negative experience but I would say that the ones which I have written about which are maybe uh from slightly darker times in my life I don't tend to listen back to <laughs> ever yeah and also the questions sort of about um how to deal with your history and your personality as you create, right? You know, as artists, there is a, a big option to present your work, you know, as a solo artist, and that brings up a lot of things. Um, I definitely don't have a concrete answer, really. And like Polly, uh, I just believe in becoming as good as possible so that you can write when your life might to you seem like it's dull. However, um, I think a, a true artist is able to sort of call upon anything that goes on, whether it's from watching films or going through a walk in the park, um, rem remembering a heartbreak or remembering a really good summer, you know, so you kind of, you want to be able to just, yeah, bring that up no matter what's going on. I think that touches also, it kind of goes back onto the technique thing that we were talking about earlier, doesn't it? And that's something that, that you kind of, as you have been writing for a long time, you suddenly realise actually that's sort of a tool that you can go back and work on if you know that you can sort of pull out this film that you watched or this book that you've read and you've kind of compiled these things, which although it didn't feel as if you were like writing a song, it's all kind of in there and you're just kind of educating yourself as you go along. It's a very therapeutic process, isn't it? To write when you're really down, it definitely makes you kind of, you feel kind of um, new at the end of it. Yeah, for sure. It's the most Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, That's anyway, wonderful. thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Yeah. Sure. Thank you very so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us.